Thank you very much. I was very impressed in these few days in the country by many things, by the extremely sophisticated public health thinking about mental health, which is not so common in other countries of the region. I was impressed by the food, which is fantastic. <laughs> it's not easy always to understand the patois for me. So I try Wa Guam with you today, something like that. Yes, but it's, it requires a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot of. <laughs> so I will be better in the future, believe me. In the very kind presentation of the two doctors, it was mentioned that I have, for professional reasons, uh, contributed to mental health policies and service development in more than 50 countries because my role in WHO. Um, this is important because after many years of going around countries trying to assist technically countries in preparing innovative uh, mental health policy and, and plans, uh, I have reached the conclusion that in spite of the enormous socioeconomic differences, of the enormous cultural differences uh, among countries, so if you work with Norway, it's not the same thing, but if you are working in China, if you work in Jamaica, it's different than working in Yemen. So that's quite trivial. However, what I have observed is that there are some common, uh, quite common, uh, global barriers to the implementation of any innovation in mental health. So it is bizarre because you find the same barriers in rich countries and in poor countries, in extremely sophisticated countries and in countries which are more uh, uh, in uh, socio-economic or cultural conditions of oppression, when maybe exposed to dictatorship or exposed to wars and so on. And there are a number of barriers that obviously they, they are shaped in a different way in, in, in each of these countries. But in a sense, those barriers are very similar, like the fact that the Western biomedical model of psychiatrists is so prevailing, is so colonizing the rest of the world, that at the end, it's like traveling in uh, Hilton or Sheraton. Wherever you go, is the same. No? And wherever you go, uh, the discourse of many psychiatrists is the same. Uh, psychiatric hospitals are miserable everywhere. Rich and poor countries, miserable. Are they violating human rights? Everywhere. So you start recognizing that there are some barriers that are, in a way, even more powerful than socioeconomic and cultural differences that obviously exist among countries. I will try to show you the four or five barriers that I have with my colleagues identified as quite common. The, the universal key issue, obviously, is that there is a resource gap everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, psychiatrists start cry crying. We need more, we need more doctors, more nurses, more cars, more drugs, more psychotropic drugs. No, we are poor. And this is absolutely the same if you are in the US or you are in Botswana. No. The first thing is resources to treat and to prevent mental disorders remain insufficient. Second gap, resources for mental health care are inequitably distributed. And the third is that resources for mental health are inefficiently utilized. So I will just show you one slide. This is the World Bank classification of countries. 
low-income countries, low-middle-income countries, higher-middle-income countries, high-income countries. The entire bar, yellow plus red, is the envelope with the dollars for health, not for mental health, for health. The yellow is the portion of the money in the envelope that is spent for mental health. So you see that in high-income countries, on average, 6.87% of the health envelope is devoted to mental health. In 3.4, in higher middle, 2.7 in low middle, in 1.5 in low income. But remember, these envelopes are not the same. They do not contain the same amount of dollars. So 1.5 of a small envelope is very little, while 6.8 of a big envelope is much more. So the conclusion is, as, as more you are poor, less you invest in mental health. This is what I call my ministerial slides. When I go to see a minister that has not the patience for 45 minutes lecture, has one minute for me, <laughs> I can't show, as I'm doing with you, 20 slides, but just one. So this is the slide for the minister. The burden of mental disorders represents 13, 16% of the global burden of disease. But the percentage, on average, globally, of the investment in mental health of government is 3%. So you use the 3% of your budget to treat the 13% of the burden. So in a way, it's quite visual, even if it is a little bit uh, simplistic anyway. So money is too little. Number one. Number two, I spoke about inequity. So the distribution is inequity, inequitable. In red, you see the countries where there are between zero and one psychiatrist per 200,000 population. So you see all Africa, India, China, they have between zero and one psychiatrist per 200,000 population. There are countries where you have two psychiatrists for the entire country, Mozambique, for instance, yeah? Ethiopia, for instance. Yeah? Or in yellow, you see the countries where there is between one and five, huh? one and five psychiatrists per 200,000. In blue, those who are between five and 10. And in very light blue, the countries that are very rich, and they have more than 10 psychiatrist per 200,000 population. But be careful. While the red countries, obviously, the message is there is too little. We need more. That doesn't mean that automatically that if you are rich and you have many psychiatrists, your mental health system is fantastic. You see that Russia is here. Russia has a lot of psychiatrists. All concentrated in few large asylums, punto. So this richness in psychiatrists means nothing in terms of reaching out the needs of mental health of the Russians. Or take Argentina. Argentina has more psychoanalysts per square meter than mosquitoes, but, <laughs> but, however, however, these are all working in private settings and not in public settings. So, so, so this richness doesn't mean automatically that the system is good. This is true also for the US. This is true for many countries. So in a way, where, when you have an epidemiological data showing that you are poor, means that you are poor. When you have an epidemiological data showing that you are rich, means very little. You have to, to look at what does it mean that you are rich. So, inequity. Then inefficiency. I, I'm just taking the example of the bids, psychiatric bids. Why use the bids? Because bids equal means resources, money. Right? Where there are the bids, there are the money. There is the money. So if you take the bids, 62% of the bids, psychiatric bids, in the world are still in asylums. 20% of the beds are in general hospitals, psychiatric beds, are in general hospital. 
only 16% of beds are in residential facilities, which are not hospitals, but are home, protected apartment, uh, halfway houses, these kind of things. So the suggestion of WHO is to have exactly this pyramid revert. Too many beds in general in psychiatric hospital. Eh? So we need more beds in general hospital, much, much more beds in uh, non-psychiatric facilities, and zero beds in asylums. Okay? So Professor Leon Eisenberg, a child psychiatrist from Harvard that was a very good friend of mine, a person I admire very much, you say, the psychiatrists not only are poor, but are, they are also stupid. Uh, I mean, it was a provocative comment to say, not only you have little money, but you spend this money in, in a very irrational way. So it is inefficient the way you spend. You are poor and you spend 64% of your health, mental health budget in this country goes to maintain Bellevue. So the rest of the Jamaican population is receiving the smaller part of the mental health investment, and the bigger part is devoted to maintain the asylum. So that's, that means being inefficient. So insufficient, inequitable, and inefficient. So all this results in a gap in treatment. So we have a, we, we publish in JAMA, a, Serious cases receiving no treatment at all during the last 12 months, so people that were un totally untreated. While you may expect that in developing countries between 76% to 85% was receiving nothing, it's more surprising that in developed countries between 35 and 50% are receiving nothing. In the US, uh, more than 60% of severe depression goes untreated because people have no money to treat. Uh, so the problem of the gap in treatment is not just the problem of the poor countries, but it's also a problem of the rich countries. So there is a treatment gap. Uh, but the treatment gap, you see, obviously, uh, in yellow, the untreated. At global level, schizophrenia, 40% goes untreated. Major depression, between 40 and 60, 50%. Alcohol use, large amount in yellow, untreated. Uh, child adolescent mental disorders, large amount, untreated. So the conclusion is that the resources are far from the needs. Far means they are insufficient or they are wrongly allocated. People need more services with more rational allocation of resources. People need services close to home. Primary care and secondary care should represent the main components of a mental health system. While that's not the case, the tertiary care still represents the main component of the mental health system. So we did a sort of bestseller. We published in 2007 uh, a survey that was uh, a survey on barriers to improvement of mental health services in low-income and middle-income countries. And it's now a bestseller, this paper, because it has, has a terrible, tremendous impact factor because people are curious to know what are those barriers. My presentation of today is not reflecting exactly this article that is 2007, is a rather old, is a little bit more updated, my presentation of today, compared with the 2007 uh, Lancet series. But it was the first paper on this argument. There are a number of barriers. Barrier one, these are the common barriers that you can find in China and in Norway. Mental health resources, means beds, money, and stuff, are centralized in big cities and are centralized in large institutions. Resistance by mental health professionals and workers whose interests are served by large hospitals is the main explanation for 
keeping this irrational, irra sometimes it's more than irrational, can be inhuman in many cases, uh, institutions. Difficult, the social inclusion of long-term users, not easy, but thinking the situation that you have in this country, and the need for transitional funding to shift to a community-based service. If you shift the model from an uh, old hospital-based model to a modern, innovative community mental health model, you don't do it in one night. You need time. And this transitional period may require transitional funding that when you are funding the old system and funding the new system. So you need a Minister of Health which is somehow is visionary because should he make an investment that sometimes goes beyond his own uh, length as a minister. So you need a, a minister who, who see the future and invest in the future. So this is the barrier one. And the barrier one is in Paris, at one of the largest psychiatric hospitals in the world, terrible, in Geneva, which is the the uh, Bellevue here, Belle Idée in Geneva, so the name, uh, so the mystification, Bellevue, Belle Idée, <laughs> terrible places with these names, and uh, large hospitals that is not, uh, not able to, to, to make a transition to modern era. And there is tremendous resistance by psychiatrists and by nurses as well. That's barrier one. Barrier one is in Jamaica, barrier one is in China, barrier one everywhere. Barrier two. Before talking about barrier two, let me give you an example. You see that uh, the incredible reduction of bids was done in Brazil uh, that went through a quite radical reform, shifting money and resources from asylums, private hospitals a lot, to community-based services with an impressive decrease of bids in the, in the country. The, the Brazilian, they did a, a double strategy. They reduced the number of bids, but they also reduced the size of hospitals because they discovered, quite obviously, that it's much more difficult to do the institutionalization in a large hospital than in a small hospital. So they did also a transition uh, trying to reduce the size of hospitals. So the reduction, sorry, the reduction is on two sides. The size of the hospital and the number of beds. Now, this is a, a big discussion about how to do rational deinstitutionalization. It will take hours to discuss this. I want just to give you a message. I have the impression that there is, when we discuss deinstitutionalization, there is a, too much emphasis on the exit door of the asylum. So deinstitutionalization means to push out patients, which sometimes is extremely difficult because patients have no family, because patients are extremely chronic, because there, there is no money to find solutions. So this is something that people are in the panic. You go and you talk to a minister, and the minister says, I agree with you, I agree with WHO, we should do the institutionalization. I have 1,000 chronic patients, doctor, what should I do? How can I discharge these patients? The institutionalization is not just discharging patients, but in a sense, is to work on the entry door, as to prevent admission. Ideally, imagine that you have an hospital of 1,000 beds. You do a tremendous effort in terms of money, thinking, energy, to, dis to discharge 250 patients, so one-fourth of, of these patients is discharged. This hospital will continue to be refilled for the next two centuries. Imagine, is a paradoxical example, that you close the entrance door of an hospital. You say, from tomorrow, 
no new patients. New patients should go to general hospital or to community mental health care. No new patients in the hospital. And then you do nothing. By natural death, this hospital will disappear in 20 years. We did the survival curve in Italy when we started the reform. We had 100,000 inpatients in 1990 psychiatric hospitals. Italy has 60 million inhabitants. And uh, this, today, there are no psychiatric hospitals, and, no, and these people are not in hospitals. So the defenders of the reform say that these 100,000 people are all fantastically socially included a lie. <laughs> the enemy of the reform, the conservative group, say that these people are going in the street, killing, uh, suiciding, going to prison, a lie. No evidence of any increase of suicide or crime after the Italian reform. Where are these patients? 50% died by natural death during the 17 years of the application of the reform. So in a way, if you invest more in preventing new admissions, you pro and you are less agitated about pushing out people, probably you are uh, weakening much more the hegemonic role of the psychiatric hospital. Uh, this is the model that we call idea. Idea, genial idea, is increasing community care for those who can leave the psychiatric hospital, a portion of the population of the hospital. Decreasing admissions in psychiatric hospital through beats in general hospital. Enhancing the quality of care and the rights of those who stay in psychiatric hospital. Barrier two. Integration of mental health in primary care. This is a f the most fantastic rhetoric of the World Health Organization. When, when WHO doesn't know what to say, say primary health care. It's a sort of <laughs> magic word. It's a magic word that solves every problem. We have quite strong evidence, which is, which, but it's not easy to uh, make this kind of integration. If you go to Shanghai, where a, a, a general practitioner in primary care is obliged to see 190 patients per day, this person, when you are going there, why you have to listen to referral, back referral, mental health, talk to the family, the guy says, no way, I have one minute, put. So very often, the primary care workers are already extremely overburdened, and they tend to refuse to have a strong uh, implication with mental health problems. Then what we do is, what do we offer to our colleagues in primary care? Training, 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 training. This is another delusion of, <laughs> of UN agencies. They want to train everything, everyone, every day. It's a business, it's a business. What our colleagues in general practice needs is support. Is, is support, supervision. So they are not children that they need to be trained in psychiatry. They are person that if they decide that they want to treat some mild or moderate case of depression or to do a serious referral and back referral, what they need is to have the possibility once a week to have a telephone and hotline to call someone and when they call, there is not the music beep, 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 for three hours. No. From two to four, you call this number. On the other side of the line, there is a senior psychiatrist listening to you. And 80% of the cases are purely in need of re being reassured. You can say, yes, colleague, you did well. Don't worry. Don't panic. Call me tomorrow if you think that this patient is not going well. So, more than training, more than investing in training, is important to invest in supervision, call it supervision, coaching, uh, support, whatever. We had a nice experience in Sri Lanka where we created a, the medic, medical officers of mental health 
uh, medical officer of psychiatry that are people receiving three months of mental health training. Their duty list is similar to that of psychiatry diploma holders. They work under the supervision of district psychiatrists and they de facto fulfill the role of leading the mental health response. So in other words, this was after the tsunami. We went to Sri Lanka and uh, as in when there are this kind of uh, big disaster, there was a big flow of money. So we got an enormous amount of money from Finland and Japan, and the money was more than the needed. So we asked the donors, the two countries, do you mind if we spend this money not only for the east coast of Sri Lanka that was eaten by the tsunami, but we spend this money for the entire country, uh, Sri Lanka is a relatively small island, and to try to, to invest in a changing of the shift in the paradigm of mental health. And the donor said, yes, provided that you report what you're doing, we accept this idea. And what we did was uh, to invest in training uh, general practitioners in a very short training in mental health that made these people much more skillful in terms of managing mental health training. And, and, and it was a quite successful experience until uh, something happened that was very sad. When these people started using this diploma given of three months given by WHO, seeing patients at private level, they, 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 the College of Psychiatrists was late. So it, at the end, uh, they were stopped because this was not. And uh, <laughs> we created this mechanism. But the model of training intermediate pro professional uh, skilled in mental health without being necessarily a highly uh, sophisticated specialist is a model interesting to, uh, to, to, to overcome barrier two. Barrier three, where is the missing number? Uh, well, why health? public health thinkers, they have created three numbers, primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. But systematically, the investment is in private and tertiary, put. So that is what uh, it was called by David Goldberg, uh, the American bypass. So if you have a mild case of mental health, you are in primary care. If the mild case is moderate or severe, you bypass everything and you go to the psychiatric. Because in between, there is nothing. There is nothing or not enough. So the problem is the investment in secondary care. Non-hospital-based specialist care is the core of the mental health system. The core of the mental health system is not the hospital. The core of the mental health system is the community. That's the point. We, doing a sort of perversion in terms of the formal thinking of public health, we consider the beds in general hospital as a function of a secondary level intervention. So you are responsible of a community mental health center of a catchment area of Jamal community. You have a team, you have a location where you are working. You may refer acute patients to a base, psychiatric base in general hospital, and this referral is a, at second level referral, so is a resource that the secondary level, community mental health, has available to manage acute situations. If you do that, a strong community service and you have enough number of beds in general hospital, you can avoid admission in psychiatric hospital quite easily, as it has been proven in many countries in the world. So the barrier three is required the investment, because mental disorders often determine long-term disabilities. The mental disabilities are long-term conditions. And therefore require what? What require? Asylum require long-term care. But long-term care means not asylum, 
means long-term care. Someone who is taking care of you for a long period of time, of every, for all your life, as it is the case if you have a diabetes, if you have HIV AIDS, if you are obese, if you have a cancer, if you have hypertension. So many chronic disease are managed at secondary care. They require long-term treatment, but they have not asylums for diabetic people. <laughs> long-term care means what? what? I call the 5C. Comprehensiveness. The community center should provide a broad spectrum of offers. Psychiatric care, yes, but also family support, housing, employment, inclusion strategies, rehabilitation. We cannot reproduce in the community service a biomedical logic. I'm Italian. If you go to a pizzeria in Italy, you say, OK, I'm in a pizzeria. I would like to have a pizza. <laughs> and you ask for a menu. And the menu of the pizzeria says, pizza margherita. Fine, pizza margherita. Pizza margherita. Pizza margherita. <laughs> That's not the pizzeria. <laughs> <laughs> it's a margherita place. If you go to a normal community mental health center where you receive just an interview of five minutes and then psychotropic medication and by eye, that is a pizzeria. Yes. <laughs> One type of pizza. A, a real pizzeria has a broad spectrum of offers. And a real community center offers a broad spectrum prevention, can be home visit, can be family support, can be day hospital, can be outreach intervention, can be acute management of crisis, can be psychosocial rehabilitation, can be working with the community, working with the primary care. That's a real community center. Okay. Second C, community long-term care, maybe forever, you should provide this kind of long-term care. The continuity of care. You can't have a fragmentation, a system where the hospital depends on this authority, the psychiatric hospital depends on another authority, the community service depends on another authority, the primary care depends on another authority. Because, because patient is one, and he requires what we call the therapeutic budget. Money should follow the patient. Money cannot stay with the institutions. Money cannot be attached to a date. Money should be attached to a patient. So obviously, if you want to use this money, and this money belongs to different institutions or to different organizations, that makes your life a hell. So the problem of uh, one service, one orchestra director, this is very important. And then finally, the two things, collegiality. If you ask a psychiatrist, do you have a team? Oh, yes, of course. Who well, is it composed of you? I have. There is one psychiatrist, two psychologists, three social workers, four nurses, and one occupational therapist. This is a bus line. This is, this is the line to the bus stop. It's not a, a team. <laughs> A team is a place where the power is distributed across professions, where professions are in power, where being a nurse is not being someone who is less than a doctor, or where psychologists think that psychiatrists are just prescribing drugs. <laughs> we understand complexity of the cycle. And the psychologists believe that psychology blah blah blah. We are serious because we prescribe them. They hate each other. Usually they get married after. <laughs> That's a typical perversion in mental health. Psychologists and psychiatrists they get married. But anyway, <laughs> collegiality has to do not with a long list or shopping list of profession. It has to do with a, a common therapeutic plan discussed and agreed with the empowerment of different 
skills and profession took is a is process of uh, democratization of knowledge. And finally, capacity. I was discussing with the professor uh, the other day. Uh, universities sometimes are training an old type of psychiatrist, are not providing all these kind of skills. And when the, this psychiatrist or psychologist or nurse enter in the real world, there is a sort of gap between what we have learned at the university and what we are requested or expected to do when we work in the community. So we should create a, a more a consistent uh, effort between the new required skills and the university uh, offer. In June 2006, there were 80, 48 CAPS. CAPS means Psychosocial Community Center, Centro de Atenção Psicosocial, registered in Brazil. Because we can operate if there is a political will. Yesterday, your minister made a fantastic, I'm not saying this to be nice, a fantastic performance in the parliament. And he mentions mental health quite extensively, and which is quite exceptional, because no, no, very often mental health is the Cinderella, never, never uh, rem remembered by, by, the, by the minister. Uh, but so. The minister is supporting you, yes or no. The permanent secretary is supporting you. So, I mean, the political will means the political support with the, with the money, the funding, the agreement on the plans that you have. Uh, psychiatry is a uh, good mental health system is a mix of top down and bottom up. So, uh, bottom up is that you are thinking, creating, suggesting. Top down is that someone has the money and the political power to make decisions. So th this combination depends on the political will. Now, the political will is very often is absent amongst uh, ministers. And there is a tendency among us, mental health professors, to say that the minister is stupid, is not understanding, should be educated. Uh, I'm not so sure. I have met hundreds of ministers of health. They are not stupid. They are much more intelligent than you believe. The problem is that they are receiving systematic, inconsistent, and unclear advocacy by mental health advocates. HIV advocates, patients, doctors, nurses, family, human rights advocates, all together, they are taking the same message to the more condom, <laughs> less high prices of antiretroviral medication. Boom. Malaria. More med beds, more spray. If the village has 100 inhabitants, don't give us 100 bed needs because they are broken quickly. So for 100 inhabitants, you need 500 bed needs. One message, clear, simple. On Monday, the minister <laughs> is proceeding with <laughs> Dr. Sarceno to say, Your Excellency, this is a scandal. You have to close down the psychiatric hospital. It's violating human rights. It's a terrible place. Blah, blah, blah. You say, well, Dr. Sarceno, you're a genius. <laughs> but on Tuesday, there is Dr. Sarceno, please, that going there and said, Well, you have to build a new psychiatric hospital. <laughs> you have to get the money from the World Bank. They are supporting us with the idea of having three psychiatric hospitals. One in the west, <laughs> north of the region, yeah. Yeah. another on the south, and another on the east. So the minister starts thinking that this is different from the message he got. The third day, there is a president of the psychoanalytical association <laughs> going there as well. Of course, psychiatrists are all poisoned <laughs> patients. <laughs> psychotropic drugs. <laughs> the real problem is psychotherapy. Psychotherapy, individual psychotherapy. <laughs> the fourth day, <laughs> in the family association, the family association number one, say, well, all these, our children going in the street, abandoned, no support, nothing happened. We need more security, more vigilance, 
more strong uh, repression. All right, they are voting with these people. So we need them, listen. But the day after is another association which is much more human right oriented. We should apply the UN Convention on the right of the people with disability. We should comply with the international covenants. The conclusion is the minister said, okay, fine. So let's talk with the people dealing with cancer. <laughs> <laughs> because the minister is getting not a unique, clear, strong message from the stakeholders. One. Number two, people with disorders are not organized in a powerful lobby for obvious reasons. It's much easier to have people with cancer self-organized or people with HIV AIDS self-organized than people with psychosis because it's more difficult that users from psychiatry have the same power, capacity of lobbying and so on. And number three, there is the incorrect belief that care is cost effective. Again, because the minister is ignorant and he needs to be educated. Maybe, but also because we constantly produce data based only on process data. Output, not, not on outcomes. We publish papers saying how many visits, how many doctors, how many, how many, how many. This is process indicators. It's very rare that we do studies showing that what we did changed the prevalence of a disease or reach uh, a different outcomes. So in a way, Dr. this morning you were mentioning randomized clinical trial, we need much more uh, evidence about the effect of what we do and not only how much we do. Because the fact that we do a lot, that I do more visits than you, doesn't mean automatically that the outcome is better in my team than in yours. The fact that I have uh, done number of hours of psychotherapy, number of referral, number of back referral, these are process indicators, very important. But what we have to give to the minister is also the sense that what we do has an impact on the amount of health. When Bill Gates came, Bill Gates came to David Chow and he was listening to a number of senior directors to decide to who give the money. So we were all excited. <laughs> so I went, I presented how fantastic was my program on human rights, <laughs> was respecting human rights, was increasing referral and back referral with primary care. It was deinstitutionalizing asylums that we were preventing relapse of schizophrenic people through a number of interventions, that we were doing early detection and early intervention of psychosis. After my presentation, said, okay, but against one dollar, how many suicides you will be able to decrease? Against one dollar, how many, so it was a little bit primitive, but at the same time, that's the way donors and ministers function. They want to know what are you at the end of the day. He gives you public money, money coming from the uh, fiscal <laughs> uh, taxation of citizens. And he wants to know, okay, are schizophrenic people better with this model or with this model. Sometimes we are weak in this type. So the political willingness very often is not there, not just because the minister lack of education and information, but because we lack of powerful message, of evidence-based messages, and of solid, uh, uh, in a way, uh, message. Uh, That's the way Brazil is the only country in the world who reverted the expenses. 
The breakdown of expenditures revealed a significant increase in the extra hospital value, 404% more, and a decrease in the hospital uh, value, 39%. The historical series of the disaggregated per capita expenditures showed that in 2006, for the first time in Brazil and I, I, in the world, the extra hospital expenditure was higher than the hospital one. This slide is, uh, from public health perspective, is a very interesting slide. You see that in 2000. And six, the two line cross, and uh, the, the red line, which is gastos and uh, extra hospitalarius, so investment in community mental health services, was going up and up and up and up and up. And in 2006, cross the line, getting down and down and down on the investment on psychiatric hospital. And in 2006, the two lines cross, and Brazil starts investing much more in extra hospital uh, mental health than in intra hospital mental health. That's a very interesting and very rare figure to, to see in, 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 uh, at, at global level, I would say. So this, uh, this important uh, uh, change is not just, just philosophical, it's a change in resources, in money, and in possibilities. Uh, Chile did something very interesting because between 1999 and 2006, the fraction of the health budget allocated to mental health increased almost twofold from one to two. And in the same period, the percentage of the mental health budget allocated to psychiatric hospital decreased from 57%, you have 64 in this country, to 33%. So today, Chile is investing 33% of the budget. In, uh, so Chile is, of course, so joining the group of the good, the good students. Mm -hmm. Last barrier, barrier five. The mental health leadership, the leaders, you are the leaders. Mental health leadership lacks public health skills, and sometimes serves narrow interests. I'm not talking about you, I don't know, maybe you are fantastic. You serve large interests and you have a fantastic public health background. I'm talking in general. I'm talking in general. Because if you go to small countries, for instance, and you ask the minister, but who is your advisor for mental health? Systematically, the answer is, is the president of the psychiatric association, the no or is the professor of psychiatry of the university, which is fine. But the fact that someone is a fine clinician doesn't mean automatically that he is the best advisor in terms of public health planning, service reorganization, budgeting, policy. I mean, being a good clinician I would not use Sigmund Freud. Uh, <laughs> 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 for other functions. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the best, the best uh, mental health planners are epidemiologists, are public health people, not necessarily coming from the mental health field. So don't mix the the quality of a psychiatrist as a psychiatrist with the quality of being a leader. In meta, being a leader means different things. So those who rise to leadership position often only train in clinical management. Public health training does not include mental health. It's very rare that public health schools teach mental health. They teach infectious disease, non-communicable disease, uh, tropical disease, but very rare to get training in mental health. But I am the professor of global mental health so, and global health, where I'm teaching a lot of mental health. And conservative views prevail in professional organizations sometimes. And last but not least, let me say that pharma industry still has too much influence in terms of uh, 
shaping the culture of uh, mental health professions. So I think uh, that uh, we should be more independent and more ethically driven than uh, pharma industry driven in the way we <coughs> imagine the mental health system. Parifa. The conclusion of my lecture is that these barriers, I found them very commonly in so many countries. Obviously, the solutions are different from one country to the country. The barrier is the same, but the solution for Jamaica cannot be the solution you are using in Japan, or the solution in Yemen would be not the solution adopted. So, their cultural elements, anthropological elements, sociological elements, socioeconomic difference, start matter. They matter, obviously. Uh, if you are in an Arab country where still in Egypt the, the uh, compulsory admission of women and of men is different. The compulsory admission to psychiatric hospitals of men should be signed by a psychiatrist, by a doctor. Why? woman should be signed by the husband. <laughs> so when you are working in a country where this is the culture that informs the law, of course the solutions that you have to invent, discuss with your colleagues are different if you are in Jamaica. Well, obviously that's not the problem. <laughs> so what I want to say is not that the world is globalized. The solution are not global, but the problems are very, very much global. So the barriers are very global. The solutions are absolutely local. Uh, that requires a strong shift of paradigms of all of us. From exclusion to inclusions is not a slogan. It's not a lip service. It means the focus on rights and use of social inclusion, the recovery approach. So in a way, I prefer a free schizophrenic citizen, delusional, but respected in his or her uh, freedom and rights than a treated schizophrenic person, treated in an inhuman environment. That's a value choice. You would say, you prefer that, I prefer a different thing. But we have, we have to discuss whether the prevailing vision is focused on symptoms or focus on recovery. It's focus on ability, disability functions or on DSM-3, ICD-10, blah, blah, blah. Or social inclusion is an outcome or is something that may happen or not, is an option. So it's an important uh, paradigm shift. Second paradigm shift is from biomedical to psychosocial approach. So the, the social dimension of care. Care is not just biomedical. Can be biomedical. Of course, in acute case of a highly delusional, agitated patient, of course, that the person is in the hospital, will require medication, will require a bed in an hospital, a doctor, a nurse. But this cannot be the gold standard for disorders that may last all their life and where most of the time people are not in acute phase. And what they need when they are not in an acute phase is a house, is a work, is an affective relationship, is a sexual life, is still many other things which has, have to do with the normal life of citizens. So it's from biomedical to sex. It's not an alternative. It's not biomedical is useless. I'm not saying this. I'm a doctor, a medical doctor. I think it's very important. But it's a component of the mental health picture. The third shift is from beat to opportunity in life. We still consider, I mean, you know that in Greek, the word clinical, clinical comes from the ancient Greek, klinos. Klinos is the baby. 
So the clinical was meaning in ancient Greek that the doctor is bending on the bed. Uh, the clinician is going to look at the bed. <laughs> That's the, the, the origin of the word clinical. I am not convinced that, that what we need is schizophrenic in beds. We need schizophrenic standing. Jamaican citizen with schizophrenia, not schizophrenia who are Jamaican. Citizen become first, who are Jamaican with cancer, who are Jamaican with diabetes, who are Jamaican with schizophrenia. And as a citizen should stand. And being on a bed should be considered an rare event that may occur, as occur also in our life when we are in need of a bed in an hospital because we have a cancer or diabetes or other diseases. So this is another paradigm shift. And then one of the problems of the hospital is that it has a short-term views. So the problem is the acute case, manage the acute case to reduce the symptomatology. While the problem of majority of people with mental disorders is not the acute phase, but is a long-term phase, is the progressive loss of their capacity of being uh, living in an effective environment, living in a relationship, uh, living, in a, having life skills of everyday life. So the psychosocial rehabilitation has been considered too often by psychiatrists as a sort of ancillary activity, you know, which is sort of done by uh, a nurse or by someone or some volunteer that is doing ashtray or is doing puppets. Uh, I have visited plenty of these kind of uh, in hospitals. <laughs> Doctor, come to see our rehabilitation center, okay. in the squalid place where <laughs> one nurse looking at the TV <laughs> and one patient's room. And this is rehabilitation. It's not rehabilitation. This is entertainment of patients. From Latin, intratenere, entertain, to keep inside. Uh, rehabilitation has to do to increase the contractual capacity of patients to be citizens, which require different type of intervention. So these four shift of paradigms are uh, something which has nothing to do with the mental health plan of the policy has to do with something that should happen culturally and ethically within all of us as mental health professionals. Thank you very much.